Welcome to Constellations, the podcast from Kratos, where industry leaders share their thoughts and experience on the future of space business, policy, and opportunity. If you like Constellations, please support us by giving a rating and review on iTunes. And don't forget to share this podcast online to help our community grow. Welcome to Constellations, the podcast from Kratos. My name is John Gilroy, and I'll be your moderator. Today, we're going to take a different look at satellites and technology and see how they're impacting agribusiness. With us is Wade Barnes, co-founder and CEO of Farmer's Edge, a company focused on precision agriculture. The term itself has been around a while, but today we have the perfect storm of satellites and technology to put the accuracy down to a centimeter into the hands of farmers. The phrase, doing more with less, is certainly bandied about in the national world. However, there is a limited amount of arable land and consistent increase in mouths to feed. Now, wait, I've heard all kinds of terms to describe the business you're in. I've heard it called precision farming, precision agriculture, digital farming. What's the right term, and how is it different from regular farming? Well, I, I mean, I think there's a progression, you know, so from what we would call conventional farming, there was a movement towards precision, which was the use of GPS technology, which essentially helped drive the tractor straighter in the field. And then um, people started to use precision uh, technology to to more precisely place fertilizer and seeds. And, and the byproduct of that was a, a whole bunch of information and data. So there was yield maps and soils information and so um and and then there was a progression towards digital and so you know monsanto acquired a company here a few years back uh, called climate corp that was essentially ran by a bunch of ex google guys that were creating kind of a derivative crop insurance using farm data and so now you've seen a path of you know these byproducts that come from precision ag this huge amount of data set to utilize that information to really kind of zone in and help farmers make decisions. And it's sort of the big data revolution in agriculture. So I would say Farmer's Edge has sort of essentially gone through that same progression. We were a precision agriculture company that helped farmers, you know, utilize the precision technology that was embedded in their farm equipment. And then we evolved what I would call a digital company. And so a digital agriculture. And and I, I think at times in, in the marketplace, the difference between precision and digital gets a little bit skewed. So so we would consider ourselves a digital company. Um, we, uh, we know John Deere is really focused on the digital space. Bayer slash Monsanto is really focused on the digital space and and, and we are too and, and those are our kind of main competitors in the marketplace and so we uh, enjoy um, taking on these big heavyweights uh, in, in, in ag but uh, we have a little more level playing field uh, when we take them on in the field of digital ag. Well let's make a transition here go from the farm to the food itself and people who eat the food. You know, by 2050, some estimates are that uh, there's going to be a 9 billion people in the world. And this is going to force farmers to grow enough food to feed 2 billion more people. So what has to happen to enable that increased food production? Well, I, I think it's it, it, there, there's twofold issues that are happening. One, you know, an increase in, in in the need for food production, but an increase with being grown under sustainable practices, and 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 the demand from the consumer to to have a better understanding where his food comes from, and and so, you know, digital um, fits into this, and and so one, it it helps farmers uh, uh, make better decisions, and and sometimes those decisions are used using pesticides and fertilizers and, and GMO technology, but use them in a really, um, I would say, environmentally friendly way to, to, to get the most out of it. Um, the second part is is putting traceability in. And so at the end of the day, that, that you know, um, consumers want to know if you're an organic consumer, you're going to want to make sure that, that, that you have a really clear understanding of, of whether um, the type of products have been used on that food. And, and, and I think there's also a, a, a really good story to be had for the farmers because I think farmers at the end of the day are, are actually a lot of times sort of painted with a bad brush on 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 the environmental side of things and and farmers actually uh, do a really good job of being environmental stewards because it's good business for a grower to be a, a good environmental steward it's, it's not good business to waste fertilizer and put too much on and so when you're able to utilize technology to 
to create this traceability and transparency. Uh, consumer feels better and the farmer does. So, so I think, you know, in order to feed people in a, in a sustainable and responsible way, uh, I think technology is going to play a huge role going forward. And I think one factor that is really important and more and more important in the world to come is water. And so satellite technology can assist farmers by using precision methods to use the correct amount of water for the crop, can't it? Yeah, I mean, we're doing that right now. So, and, and there's multiple different ways, but, you know, one, um, ensuring uh, through through technology that, you know, the right variety meets the right parts of the field. But, but you know, if you look at specifically when it comes to, to water and irrigation, you know, through satellite imagery, we're able to identify you know, um, which sprinklers on a, on a pivot irrigation system that is being more efficient because we can pick these subtle differences up in the field. And this might be, you know, 30 centimeters uh, different. Well, 30 centimeters, that's amazing that satellite imagery can go down to that small level. One of the real interesting parts from space is to be able to see these really sort of uh, fine details that then suddenly a grower can go out and make it make a difference. It, it, and, and again, it's saving the grower water, which is economically smart for him to do that. Uh, but it's also increasing his yields because the other side of it, if he's not putting enough water on, you know, he's reducing his yield. So, and he's not making good use of the other input. So it's a, it's a really important thing. And, 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 and that's one of the progressions that we've seen in satellites. You know, I've been in this business for a long time and, you know, we, we tried to utilize satellites in the early stages to help make, you know, in-season uh, agronomic decisions. And, you know, with Landsat, it was really difficult because of cloud cover. And, you know, so, so farmers, agronomists, um, you know, they, they went away from that and there was a focus towards drones. But then people realized that, you know, drones are really expensive, even though that they're, they don't seem that expensive, uh, that it might be $2,000 for a drone. It's the cost of having to operate that drone and put teams out there. And, and, and again, you're, you're, you're very reactionary to it because you have to know there's a problem in a field to go out with the drone. As, as these micro satellites have come in and where you can get data, you know, almost every day, that has just changed the landscape for making kind of in-season decisions with technology. And, and that's really been a big part of what we've been doing. You know, we, we incorporate this type of satellite data inside our tool set that uses soil moisture probes and data collection and farm equipment and weather stations. But it's a critical component to, to giving a grower kind of a true sort of uh, um, vision of, of what's happening in his field on a daily basis. You know, the way I understand it, is that uh, precision agriculture includes satellite earth observation, artificial intelligence, big data, all kinds of things. So what are the challenges that farmers face when trying to integrate these technologies into what you know, someone may call traditional farming? Well, the, the, the big challenge, I think, is is that you know, you've know you got, I will call it more traditional precision ag, which if a grower owns a tractor or combine, you know, a lot of this precision technology is inside that equipment. So, so call it the hardware element is, is, you know, very available to a farmer. The, the difficulty is taking it from a hardware perspective and actually implementing a strategy. And so you've had this huge influx from Silicon Valley of lots of different um, startup companies trying to utilize information and data to help farmers make decisions. The, the, the issue that you have is that farmers will probably make 40 to 50 key decisions throughout the growing season. And what he doesn't need is an app that helps him make that one individual decision. He doesn't want 40 apps. He, he wants um, one place for his data to go that can do an analysis that then helps him to make that decision and then be connected into his business partners. And so the big challenge that a grower has is which technology do I pick to use, which one's going to be have some longevity, um, and how do I incorporate it successfully onto my farm to get a payback? And and that's been a challenge because it's a really noisy space and uh, and everybody's coming out with a shiny app that says, well, use mine and it'll be better on this than that. And so growers have to find a way to cut through this noise, pick the right 
digital partner and 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 be committed to to the technology and then and and then also be able to ensure that the technology partner you pick can showcase what the payoff actually is so that you so you so you understand there is a return let's go from apps to satellites and uh when you think about satellites and earth observation satellite revisit times and ground sample distance were once drawbacks with respect to satellite imagery for most of these agricultural projects have the newer Earth observation satellites mitigated these issues to the point where satellite imagery is a key tool for precision farming? Night and day difference. I mean, I, I would say it's kind of funny because, you know, five years ago, satellite was a bad word. You know, it, it, farmers, you know, were excited by the, the, the problem you have with, with, with a satellite when, in, when you're a farmer and you're able to utilize and have a, uh, have an image of your field that showcases a, pr- a production problem, it's game changing for you. You get really excited. I, I'm a farmer. I, I've had that experience. Then, then what happens is that the farmer wants to use it more. But then you had, you know, the frequency issues that would come with, you know, previous satellites and cloud cover. And so growers got quite frustrated by that. And they, they looked for different, you know, places to go, whether it be onboard sensors and you know, or, or drones. With, with the introduction of, of, of the kind of new wave of satellite technology and with the high frequency and, and essentially the, the more bands, all of a sudden now I would say the farm, you know, the, the industry, including farmers and industry people, are, are, are seeing the opportunity again. It's taken a while because I think it's scarred agriculture for a while. I would say the other part is that that's been difficult for ag and satellites is that satellite companies are a little bit addicted to government contracts. And so they, and, and agriculture is call it a much more lower cost sort of sector. And, and for a, a, a farmer, you know, um, I mean, he only has so much margin. And so there also needed to be a way of, of higher frequency, better product, but also at lower costs. And I, I think the, the, the new constellations that have gone up have really sort of achieved that. And I think we've really seen, a, you know, I would say a, 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 a change that, that, that's going to create a, a much more significant adoption towards satellites. I want to delve into this whole idea of decision and decision making. So farmers have to make decisions. They get satellite imagery, artificial intelligence, weather information. Kind of hard, hard to juggle all those three together. And, and how, how does your company help them make those decisions? Well, I mean, so so part of it is, is obviously, you know, satellite plays a part with the other sensors that we have. But, I mean, the best way that I, I give an example of that is that uh, we have uh, change detection that's built into our platform. And so, you know, historically, um, you know, the grower, and I'll use a, a, an insect. There's an insect that we call cutworms that when the crop is really small, will come up and chew off the, the plant and, uh, they start to, to, to eat the plant sort of in a, in a circle. And, and then, and on a, on a large field, say in, in the northern U.S. or Canada, the, uh, a field will be as much as four or five hundred acres. And so an agronomist can't really cover all that ground to find where these cutworms are and so two things will happen either a grower will make a decision to spray insecticide and spray every single acre just in case or he'll wait and hopefully um, scout and find areas of infection and then once he knows he has infection he'll spray every acre even though five percent of the fields are, are are infected and and really what 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 satellite in this high frequency satellite imagery connected to a to a digital platform um, that, that's utilizing machine learning? What it does is it starts to send alerts out to the grower that you've got the right the the the, the right type of weather conditions conducive to an insect outbreak or a disease outbreak, and then when essentially the um, when the when the satellite flies over, they're taking a picture and and then showcasing to the grower where these areas of infection are and guiding him to go out and spray it. And and you know that that's a significant um, change for a farmer because the farmer is generally protecting himself and he's having to to spend a lot of money and spray lots of acres just in case. And what you're able to do is pinpoint with you know really really strong accuracy where there is a problem and allow a grower. To react to it historically with satellite imagery you were looking at a problem that you had 
and then you would think about to plan for it for next year. Whereas these high frequency constellations, you you have a tool now that allows you to react and do something about it in the field that we just three years ago we just didn't have. You know, earlier you mentioned constellations of satellites, and there certainly is a growing number of EO satellites, and they're generating massive amounts of data. And at one time, collecting the data was the challenge, but now I guess the challenge is analyzing the data and and using it to make decisions. So, so who does this analysis, and more importantly, who owns the data? Well, with the partnerships that we have, I mean, I mean, we we've built our own IP to do a lot of that work. Now, um, I mean, we're a little more tech focused now that some of the other, some of these satellite companies obviously are more than willing to build that IP and and and, and work with customers. Uh, we we like to internalize that IP and protect that. So um, I, I think it's really sort of user dependent. And then I guess, you know, every satellite company thinks about their data sets and the ownership of it in a different way, I guess. Um, I mean, our our view is is that, you know, when it comes to farmers' data, they they own their data. Um, we, we own the generally the the um, derivative products that's created from it. But, uh, um, you know, data ownership at a farm level is becoming a hot topic, whether it, I think, be from satellite pictures to um, equipment information to soil data, um, because I think, you know, people are starting to understand that that data can create a significant amount of value and, and uh, people certainly don't want it to fall into the wrong hands. So, so that, that, that's a topic that I think continues to, to heat up and, and certainly, you know, digital companies like ourselves need to be pretty pure on which side of, of the fence you're on on data ownership. You know, Wade, thousands of people from all over the world have listened to this podcast. If you're listening now, you can go to Google and type in Constellations Podcast and you can get to our show notes page. There you can get transcripts from all 77 seven interviews. It's like a book. <laughs> also, you can sign up for free email notifications for future podcasts and great guests like you. You know, earlier in the interview, you said that five years ago, satellites was a bad word for farmers. What about five years from now? What kind of changes do you see happening in the world of uh, technology for satellites and farmers? Well, I, I just think that, you know, when you see agriculture and the progressions that happen, um, so I'll, I'll use a, a good example. Um, when GPS technology came in kind of mainstream at a farm, where, and I, I knew farmers that had planted their crops without GPS for 20 years. And the moment they started to utilize GPS, when the GPS quit working for whatever reason it was, they would literally stop their planter and wait for it to get fixed because it became such an embedded part of their management system. Um, and I, I think that this is where you're going to see, pro, you know, um, components like satellite imagery will be very similar. Once a grower relies on that data set to essentially monitor and protect his crop, um, one, his expectations go up. So, so uh, you know, what was great yesterday needs to be better uh, tomorrow. And and for the companies that are that are building, you know, newer constellation, more frequency, you know, um, better sensors, um, that market will evolve. But what I think you'll see is you'll never see growers go backwards. And once you utilize technology to enhance your your business or your life, you don't go backwards. So I think the table set for for satellite to make a big impact in in production agriculture. Um, I think the challenge will be pushed out to satellite companies to continuously bring better products to the market at lower price points. So Wade, you mentioned about technology evolving. So how is this evolution is going to impact crop production and quality? Well, I, I, I think as as technology gets better, and I think when we talk about technology, I'm, I'm talking about, you know, AI, better data analytics, you know, I would say better decision making. You know, you're going to see increase in production and you'll see increase in production and the form of lowering costs. Um you know, you, you will also see the ability for, you know, food companies or consumers to, to get, I would say, much more uh, pinpoint accuracy about the quality of what they want and how they want to produce. And because they've never had, you know, such connectivity to the primary producer. So, so I think you're going to see a lot more direct, um, 
consumer food company contact to the primary producers than you've ever seen before, which I think is really exciting. And I think it's part of the digital disruption and you know, the, you know, um, technologies enabled a, a, the consumer to get closer to the manufacturer and there's just more pressure on the, on, on, on the middle people. So, so I think the middleman will need to evolve as well, but you know, the more confidence and, and, that, that a consumer has in the food system, the better it is for everyone. And I think, you know, technology is going to enable that, and uh, which I think is, you know, really exciting for everyone. You just gave us some insights on the technology's impact on crop production. Are there other aspects of agribusiness where technology can reduce costs or maybe speed time to market? Oh, absolutely. I mean, if you think about what satellites can do for logistics, about understanding, you know, whether ships are being, you know, loaded in certain ports, ships on route to different destinations, you know, train. I think, you know, the world I live in is around production ag. Um, but, you know, all the business that surrounds production agriculture of how they get products to market, how they manufacture or process, you know, commodities into real food products. I mean, the same impact by these high frequency um, satellite constellations are going to impact those businesses as well. So um, I I can't imagine that uh, big companies like Cargill and ADM aren't making really good use of that type of technology. Well, you know, earlier you mentioned the cost of using drones in agriculture. But uh, making this transition to artificial intelligence, big data, that can also represent a significant investment. So what kind of return are farmers getting on this investment? And is it enough to justify it? Well, I, I think it's about management. Or, and so, you know, issues that farmers, I, I always say that, that you know, there's a, a bit of a fallacy in, in the discussion around agriculture. People believe that we're running out of farmland. And to be honest with you, we're not really running out of farmland, but we're running out of this farming talent, people that truly know, understand how to go out and grow crops. And so what happens is, is that you have consolidation into agriculture, a smaller farmer gets bigger. And what happens is as a farmer gets bigger, you know, he's spreads his knowledge, his management systems across more acres. And and what and as they get bigger and bigger, that becomes more difficult. And so suddenly, uh, as you use data and AI to, to make those critical decisions, well, suddenly now you don't need as many key managers because you can't, you, you can scale technology, you can't scale people in the same way. And so um, I, I think that uh, as we go forward, that's going to be a crucial component. And when you have that, that's a huge return on investment. Because if you talk to anybody in business, you'd say, you know, what's the price? You know, what, what's the value of the best managers? And you know, they're it's, it, they're they're priceless, and, and there's not enough of them. But what you'll find is is that through data and AI and, and and predictive modeling, and you know, you're you're going to be able to scale your top managers dramatically and and who knows someday maybe even you might even see you know ai or robots managing themselves so but i i think um you know that component is just starting to touch ag and i think there's a huge opportunity in that space now the the big problem in order to to drive ai decisions you need good data and and agriculture is pretty data sparse and so it takes some work to go out and implement technologies at a farm level whether it be satellite or um, sensors in order to generate that data that feeds the ai algorithms that drives those decision support tools but in the next few years i'm i guarantee you that you're going to see a lot of big tech get more focused on ag you're going to hear a lot more about companies that i think like Google or SAP or or Microsoft that's going to focus in on agriculture because agriculture's you know quietly such a dominant player economically uh, around the global land the global space so so I I, I think you're going to see huge strides in that in that sector earlier in the interview Wade you talked about uh, big companies like Cargill and Deere and and I think they're pursuing digital farming. So can this technology put in the hands of smaller farmers be an equalizer? Can it help them compete with the larger agribusinesses? Oh, uh, look, I, I think that if you look at the digital space in ag, there's a few companies that have adopted really quickly to digital and made huge investments, and one of them being Deere and the other one being Bayer. 
there's a lot of other companies that haven't embraced it. They pay probably lip service to digital, you know, in order to make their shareholders feel comfortable. But I think there's a big shakeup coming. And I think that the titans of agriculture that you see today may not be the titans of agriculture you see tomorrow. And that I think you may see people that you haven't heard of before suddenly become dominant in certain spaces of the agricultural sector because they've embraced technology faster and utilized it to to, uh, to beat out their competition. And, you know, what do they say that, uh, um, you know, that, that it's better to be, you know, quick <laughs> than big right, right now. And, and, uh, um, I, I think, you know, there's some companies that that are that are probably pretty vulnerable, and the, and the problem with the digital space is that um, it's it's very difficult to be late and catch up. And when you've been disrupted, you can't fix it. And I kind of you know use the analogy of, of of a ship that gets hit by a torpedo. You know, um, you once once the torpedo rips through your hull, you can't fix it, and it's just a matter of time before you go you're 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 going to sink. And and I think that agriculture might be having their Amazon moment right now at the very beginning stages of it. And I think you may see some casualties in the next five years that would surprise people. You know, embracing technology is always difficult for everyone. What, um, what do you think are the biggest challenges for adoption of this new technology? What are the challenges in embracing this technology? Well, I think that the challenge is, is generally what, what the, the, the biggest challenge is what's in between, I think, uh, CEOs' ears in, in agricultural companies is, is the headspace. Is, you know, agriculture has been generally built by bricks and mortar. It's, 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 it's an asset space. And I think that um, as data moves in and technology, it makes companies that have been really successful by having big grain elevators or ports or chemical manufacturing manufacturing or seed distribution, um, they're not as as important. And I think that uh, people believe that their bricks and mortar investment will protect them. And in the digital age, it won't. And, and now the companies that I think could be you know, really successful are the ones that make the transition to the digital world, but utilize their, uh, their bricks and mortars assets to enhance their solution. And uh, so, so that would be my view. I think culturally in ag, people struggle with the idea that they can be disrupted and that that's a big risk for them. Some people talk about going from bricks and mortar to bricks and clicks. So maybe that's the future here. So um, absolutely. Crystal ball time here. Uh, we talked about five years ago and five years in the future. So, so what do you think precision ag is going to look like in the next five years? Well, I mean, I think there's going to be a lot of different components to it. So one, I, you know, I think robotics are going to play a huge factor in, in agriculture. Huge. I think that you're going to see banking and insurance change drastically where how farmers buy stuff traditionally will completely change where reinsurance companies will have closer relationships to an actual farmer, where food companies will have closer relationships to the farmer. I think that that you'll see more consolidation at the primary level with growers uh, because the growers that adopt the technology will be more successful. And I also think that um, North America will probably have better opportunities in ag because North American farms are embracing this more quickly. And when it comes to, I would say, traceability and creating higher value products to consumers, um, North America will lead the way. And so, um, yeah, so, so yeah, I mean, I, I, I see big changes in ag. Um, at the end of the day, crops will have to go into the ground. They'll, they'll need rain and they'll need to be harvested and, and they'll need to get sold. Um, it'll all just be done in a different way. Well, we'll still be doing interviews five years from now, so we'll test your little theory here. Thank you very much for your time. And unfortunately, we are running out of time here. I'd like to thank our guest, Wade Barnes, co-founder and CEO of Farmer's Edge. Thank you, Wade. Thank you so much. Thanks for listening to Constellations, the podcast from Kratos. If you like this interview, please subscribe, tell a friend, and give us a review.